All right, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Committee for Dulles Sustainable Infrastructure Webinar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jack Vega. I'm the president for the Committee for Dulles. Uh, to give you a little background on the committee, for those who are attending who may not know the committee, uh, it was formed in 1966, and it is the oldest member-sponsored organization promoting Washington Dulles International Airport. As Dulles Airport continued to expand over the years, the committee has worked, um, the committee's work has become increasingly more significant. Uh, the committee has played an active role in, in fostering and promoting uh, Dulles Airport. Uh, as dram dramatic changes occurred at Dulles and around Dulles, uh, we continue to focus on our energies towards maintaining Dulles Airport as the major economic <laughs> engine for the region and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, to learn more about the Committee for Dulles, please visit us at www.committeefordulles.org. We have an exciting program for today, so a big thank you to our program sponsors for helping make this webinar possible. Our partner sponsor is the Loudoun County Economic Development, and our advocate sponsor is the F um, Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. Uh, we appreciate their continued support of the committee. I also want to thank Jack Potter, President and CEO of EMWA and the EMWA Board of Directors for their leadership and support. And in particular, a big thank you to Roger Natsuhura, who will be presenting EMWA's 2020 Sustainability Plan. As I have learned more about the Sustainability Plan and what is happening at both IAD and DCA, I congratulate EMWA on what they've accomplished so far and for what they're planning on doing as, they, as we head into the future. I would also like to recognize our panelists for today. Uh, Robert Lazaro, who is also a EMWA board member, Lindsay Geiger, uh, Dr. Chris Liban, and Chuck Miller, who will serve as our moderator. They will be formally introduced later, but I wanna thank them for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be here today. One last thank you before I introduce and turn the meeting over to our moderator, um, these events take a lot of preparation and logistical work in advance. And I want to recognize Mike Sawyers uh, for coming up with the program idea and for working to uh, pull everything together. Uh, Mike is a member of the committee and serves on the board of directors. He is also the office director and principal engineer at Pannoni's Dulles wow. office. So Mike, thank you. And thank, your th thank you to your team at Pannoni who also provided us with the Zoom uh, logistical support. Let's get started. Uh, Chuck Miller is our moderator today. Chuck is the Senior Director of Energy Services in the Design Build Group at Pannoni. He is responsible for managing growth for the firm's distributed generation business unit. He has more than 25 years of energy, energy efficiency, and renewable energy experience, along with project development and structure finance experience. Chuck has developed projects in multiple vertical markets including healthcare, higher education, industrial and commercial, agricultural and federal. He most recently was tasked with deploying capital for the non-regulated energy division of Washington Gas, where he developed more than $150 million worth of projects over the course of four years. Chuck, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate the intro. Um, Welcome to everybody, all of our panelists. Thank you again, all of our attendees. Thank you for your time. We have an exciting program uh, put together for you this morning. Uh, I wanna start out uh, by introducing our uh, uh, main speaker. Um, you know, first of all, the topic of this conversation is uh, we're gonna be addressing sustainable infrastructure. Um, sustainable infrastructure effectively offers a holistic approach to sustainability, incorporating, atten incorporating attention to not only environmental elements, but also to socioeconomic elements, human uh, equity, diversity. It's generally an approach that, that supports healthy community development. And uh, Dulles Airport, um, MWA in general, has uh, made significant strides in this uh, approach. In September of 2020, MWA released their sustainability plan and today we have uh, Roger Natsuhara here to share MWA's approach to sustainability and their path forward. Uh, Roger joined the Metropolitan uh, Washington Airport 
Authority in October 2014, and he's the Senior Director of Engineering. In this position, Mr. Nasihara is responsible for all planning, design, environmental planning, building, permitting, code enforcement, construction, project controls of all real property controlled by the Airport Authority. Uh, he joined the Airport Authority from the Department of the Navy, where he spent five years serving as the active uh, as the acting assistant secretary of the Navy and the principal deputy assistant secretary to the Navy for energy installations and environment. In these positions, he developed department-wide policies, procedures, advocacy, and strategic plans related to all Navy and Marine Corps installations, construction, real estate, safety, energy, and environmental programs. Before serving with the Department of the Navy, Mr. N Mr. Natsuhara was the director of real property facilities and logistics office for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA. Um, he was responsible for the management and policies of all real property facilities and construction and logistics. Prior to that, he was a senior manager at Patel Memorial Institute. He retired from the U.S. Navy after 25 years of service. His first assignment in the Navy was as the surface warfare officer aboard the USS Harold E. Holt. Uh, during that assignment, he was selected to the U.S. Navy Civil Engineer Corps, where he served in a variety of positions and facilities, environmental contracts, and construction management. Prior to serving in the Navy, he was a senior engineer in the 757 Flight Test Integration Group for Boeing Commercial Airplane Company for Boeing Commercial Airplane Company in Renton, Washington. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, and a master of science in financial management from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He is a registered professional engineer and has completed the University of Michigan Executive Program. I'd like you all to welcome Roger Natsuhara. Uh, he will uh, now give us his presentation on the approach uh, and the, uh, uh, the the effectiveness of uh, the Dulles Airport or the MWA um, Sustainability Program. Roger, thank you again, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me get the screen up. Please. Okay. <clears throat> so good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting uh, MWA to give our presentation on this sustainability plan. This is a really a comprehensive plan and uh, the real hard work is done by the entire airport authority, not just the engineering department, but the entire authorities involved in this. Uh, our principal uh, staff that's been putting this together is uh, our deputy vice president for engineering, Drew Haskell and John and Matheny, who's our, our sustainability coordinator. And uh, they've just done an incredible job. Uh, of course, uh, Jack Potter, our CEO and president, uh, big champion of this, and this would have never happened without his leadership and our board. So we really appreciate uh, all the hard uh, work of everyone. Uh, and so we looked at this from the authority. Why did we need a sustainability plan? Uh, the authority had been doing a lot of work in the past, you know, changing to LEDs, uh, doing all kinds of typical energy, uh, environmental uh, program projects. Uh, but, you know, we really thought we needed a plan to really kind of codify it and make it sustainable, that the plan. So it really was to show that the executive leadership and the board, this, this is something that's very important. Uh, it's also part of our corporate uh, social responsibility plan. We have an overall uh, corporate social responsibility plan it encompasses many things of how we operate the airport in the community. Uh, you know, it, it really quantifies and, and we really want to focus our efforts on this. Uh, we wanted to partner with FAA, our other federal agencies and the airlines to address this uh, and how this really contributes to overall employee and customer satisfaction. Uh, I think what's really unique about our plan is uh, we retain NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, they're the Department of Energy uh, National Laboratory that focuses on sustainability and renewable energies. Uh, I think that's really what's made uh, our plan unique uh, and really highlights our commitment to, to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, I'm not gonna read you our mission, but uh, we do have a sustainability mission statement. Uh, I think Every organization that uh, is involved in sustainability has one, and it's very important. Uh, 
this is where we spent actually most of our time uh, initially is we really wanted to make sure our goals were clear and measurable and easy to communicate. Uh, these are the goals that really people on our staff, our tenants, our airline partners, uh, so they would understand how they can contribute. Uh, saying we're gonna decrease greenhouse gases by a certain percentage, uh, for a lot of people that's difficult to comprehend. What does that mean to them? How, how do I contribute to that? And so the, the real key for us, we believe, is uh, really making sure we could communicate how each individual department, each individual tenant airline can do their part and give them really goals that they could measure. Uh, we also wanted to capitalize on the funding. Uh, we wanted to make uh, sure that what we're doing, uh, because we are an airport, that we want to keep our costs down to keep ourselves competitive. Uh, all of you that have been involved in Dulles uh, has known that uh, you know, we've been working really hard to attract additional airlines because we are a major stimulus to the region. Uh, so keeping our costs down, uh, finding there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunities out there from federal, state, local governments, even private money that could help us uh, get uh, our goals established, help them achieve our goals. Oh, and I think what's unique, what uh, we're doing is when we say codify it, uh, we want to align our sustainability plans and goals with our design manual. Uh, we have our own design manual. Uh, we're our own authority having jurisdiction. Uh, so we have a real opportunity here at the airport to incorporate the sustainability, uh, our goals, our, our design criteria right into our manual to make sure that every project we do, we look at these uh, and not only look at them, but they're required. But we do a lot of uh, analysis to make sure that they are they're within cost, that they're, we have a return on investment in our, what we're doing. Uh, and so we can get everyone behind these uh, initiatives. And really innovation is key to our plan. Uh, we're using NREL as our resource. Uh, they are doing constantly doing research, not only the technologies, but how do you implement this? How do you do it economically? Uh, so, we, we believe that innovation, that we're not gonna come up with the new technologies ourselves, but we can innovate on how we implement those technologies, combining different technologies, combining different financial resources to get these done, finding grants. Uh, that's what I think makes our plan unique. And we're, it'll really help the community too, that uh, not only we're gonna decrease our environmental impact, we make these sustainable uh, and bring economic activities to the airport. Our framework, pretty standard framework. Uh, we have four categories, six sustainability goals. Uh, I'm gonna go through these. I'm actually not gonna spend a whole lot of time on them because I think everyone's pretty familiar with, with uh, the typical goals, but I'm gonna highlight the things that we think are unique on, on these goals. <clears throat> so we have a vision. Uh, we developed the, the six different goals they are listed, pretty straightforward. Uh, everyone's used to seeing those, uh, but it's really defining what we mean, that meeting the needs of the present while not compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, that's to us is what sustainability is about, that we got to meet our current needs, <clears throat> but we have to prepare for the future and our future generations. Uh, again, part of our goals and uh, where we spend a lot of our time and we spent a lot of time up front is we really want to make sure we have a culture in the organization. Uh, we've done a lot of ad hoc projects that I mentioned in the past, like all organizations, but how do we codify these processes? How do we make sure that everything we look at and do uh, we're looking at the sustainability, whether it's a, a concession contract, an airline contract, how we operate with FAA, TSA, and those types of things. Uh, 
So we really want to make sure that uh, sustainability is considered in all future procurement, uh, facility planning, and development activities. Uh, as I mentioned, we're updating and maintaining our design manual to meet those standards and incorporating uh, requirements directly in our design manual. So when our architects and engineers do the designs, that they're required to report to us what are they included and what are some of the innovative things they've included in our designs. And as I mentioned, we continue to work with NREL to help us keep this updated and to provide us the latest technologies and, and thoughts on uh, designing major infrastructure. Uh, we've cr created a committee to coordinate our sustainability activities across all the stakeholders within the airport. And we'll continue to review our and revise our plan. Uh, just a little bit of highlights of our design manual. Uh, these are some, we're including the key performance indicators related to sustainability. So these all get built directly into our design manual, as I mentioned, and every design has to take into account these types of things, uh, including looking at how do we design for multimodal. Uh, both, we are very fortunate, both airports, uh, Reagan has Metro today. The server line is coming as soon as COVID is done. We expect to see a lot more passengers coming on mass transit with Metro, even coming out to Dulles. Uh, how do we get folks there uh, without with reducing their carbon footprint, uh, encouraging electric vehicles and those types of things? And we incorporate life cycle cost analysis and life cycle cost accounting in all these decisions. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, how do we make these goals manageable and people that understand? And so we want to reduce our fossil fuel usage. And so instead of just saying we're going to reduce our fossil fuel, the goals are to actually say we're going to convert X number of vehicles to electric, X number to hybrid. Uh, the vehicle on the left, if you're not familiar, that's uh, kind of it's a unique people mover system at Dulles. That is a uh, plane mate. Uh, right now, they are there's actually two diesel generator uh, engines in those to move and to power the, uh, the air conditioning and those types of things. Uh, we're in the process of converting those to electric, and I will uh, have a separate slide on that. Water usage. Uh, water is something that's going to be a valuable uh, commodity here. Uh, it's a resource that uh, water is going to become more limited and much more valuable. Although right now it's a relatively low cost uh, here in Fairfax, where we're located in Loudoun. Uh, we need to think about how to reduce our water footprint, uh, saving water. Uh, so one of the things they did, we did uh, the Silver Line project. There's a uh, new cistern to collect rainwater to maintain the landscaping uh, of the new uh, Dulles Metro Station. There. Uh, again, I mentioned the NREL. Uh, what, why we're using the NREL? They're going to be providing additional technical and financial services, as I mentioned. Uh, I talked about these. So I'm not going to go through them again, but we really feel that in order to have a real long lasting sustainable plan, we have to keep up with technology. We have to keep up with what industry is doing, what other, our peers are doing. Uh, and, and NREL is a, is a laboratory will definitely help us do that and keep us abreast as we daily look at new projects, develop projects, design, build projects. Uh, some of the things in the built environment features is Photovoltaics, solar is a is a opportunity here. Uh, I'll talk more about the uh, Dulles project here, the first bullet. But we also put in a small solar project uh, for our, our transportation network companies, our Ubers and Lyfts at Dulles. Uh, on top of that uh, canopy, we have solar panels that are generating electricity for some of the lights in that area. Uh, but the, the authorities always also conducted uh, quite a bit of LED retrofits. Uh, those are the numbers and the numbers we've saved in energy and cost savings. Uh, 
municipal solid waste, the airport generates a lot of uh, solid waste. Uh, we're fortunate here that uh, in Virginia, in this area, that there's a waste to energy. Uh, so much of our waste is diverted to convert to energy. Uh, we continue to monitor that. Uh, we're looking at how do we uh, increase our recycling opportunities. And the big thing is really reducing the contaminants in, in our recyclables. As I mentioned, we're really encouraging the efficient use of public transportation. Uh, at Reagan, uh, according to uh, WRC, uh, Reagan is, is the, the first uh, major airport with a bike share opportunity. Uh, Reagan's airport, uh, because of the location, uh, it's easy to ride a bike, you can walk, metro, lots of opportunities for public transportation and alternative transportation. So we wanted to take advantage of it and we're pretty proud of that. A, a very a somewhat small project, but with a major impact for the environment and sustainability. Uh, you know, although parking is our, uh, historically for airports, our number one uh, non-aviation revenue, we, we understand the impacts of uh, what cars and traffic do and so, we're big promoters of public transportation, uh, and we look at every opportunity and, and how we can take advantage of that. Our commitment, uh, even with our reduced traffic at both airports, uh, you know, our leadership is committed to sustainability. Uh, we're committing over $22 million this year uh, into our sustainability programs, plans, and although it's 22 million, when, when we leverage that with the opportunities for grants, uh, other uh, third-party financing, that that 22 million grows substantially. So just uh, a couple of our big projects at Dulles, just to talk about real quick. Uh, we have a large scale solar generation battery storage project that we're working with Dominion on. Uh, just to highlight that, uh, we signed a three-year agreement with Dominion through April of 2023. Uh, there, right now, Dominion is awaiting PGM, the interconnection authority in the region to connect this project into the transmission grid. Uh, they've completed the site optimization of the site back in November of last year, and they're actively today soliciting a project partner. Uh, Right now, we are going through the evaluation of the uh, project. Uh, the environmental assessment will be done the third quarter of this year. And we are on track to complete negotiations by the end of this year with signing a lease with Dominion uh, the first quarter of next year. So we believe we're gonna get, get an agreement with uh, Dominion uh, one year earlier than we had planned on. Uh, this will be, uh, we believe the largest uh, solar project on any airport uh, in the country. Uh, this will be a real highlight for us. Uh, we hope to get this completed, like I said, early next year, uh, one year ahead of schedule. So it'll be a big win for the region and for the airport and the whole uh, community around Dallas. The other big project uh, going on at uh, Dallas is uh, the, our Playmate Mobile Lounge electrification that I mentioned. Uh, this is a very large project to convert uh, our Playmates and mobile lounges from diesel to all electric. Uh, we've been working with FAA uh, on a zero emission uh, vehicle grant uh, to help us with this. Uh, this is a, a large dollar amount. Uh, the airports authority has committed today almost 29 over $29 million as part of this to convert these uh, 40 plus vehicles. Uh, right now we're uh, going through the review of the proposals from our uh, proposers. Uh, we hope to award the, uh, and we anticipate awarding the uh, contract in the second quarter of this year, which will start off with the design and manufacture of a prototype. These are uh, unique vehicles, so we will do uh, prototypes, but we believe the technology is available. The uh, proposals that we've had uh, believe the technology is there. Uh, NRL has been assisting us with that uh, review of the proposals. Uh, 
uh, and the design. So we're, we're very optimistic about these. So in summary, uh, I just want to summarize again that you know our goals, we really want to make sure they're measurable, understandable, and achievable, uh, and that they have a direct impact in decreasing greenhouse gas emissions and really this whole overall sustainability. Uh, and that we wanted to make sure that it is a part of the larger airports authority plan and to institutionalize in the overall culture and make it a, a something that we talk about every day, uh, whether it's a procurement uh, for supplies, uh, a major planning design effort and infrastructure that it's something that's built into all our processes and, I, and, and we're getting there, we're almost there. Uh, and so we're actively pursuing multiple initiatives to, to codify that, codify our culture, sustainability, and execution of large and small projects. So uh, I know I went fairly quickly, uh, but I really wanted to highlight the, the innovative part. And, and I hope uh, uh, in, in coming to these uh, webinars, uh, attending conferences, uh, this is how we're gonna learn from each other. Uh, we wanna learn from you from everyone and we could we want to continue to innovate and continue to change how we do our business to make uh, both airports a much more sustainable experience for everyone so i'm going to turn it back to you chuck thanks roger um you know very very interesting and, and commendable initiative uh for for, for dulles airport I, I i wonder can you maybe expand a little bit about the uh the challenges or the hurdles that exist in in trying to you know over to un undertake these initiatives like what are the obstacles that you see that are in your way or that you've already experienced or that you might be expecting and trying to prepare for um, I wouldn't say they're obstacles. Uh, I, I think it's just education. I, I think people uh, hear broad terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Well, like, like I said, I think when we break it down to them, and this is how you can contribute. Uh, everything from the police department of, you know, we help them. Well, how long do your cars idle? Do you really need to have your engines either? Are there vehicles? And there are. There are hybrid vehicles now where there's electric. Uh, you can have the engine running while you're going from A to B, but when they're sitting there with their, just their lights on and their radios, they can be run on battery. Uh, they're, uh, so there's manufacturers out there making those things. And so we, part of this is just getting the uh, information out to folks and working with them and showing that uh, other people are using te these technologies that we don't have to be the first. It's always good to be the, the first, second user of something. Uh, and that's where we want to be that uh, if there's proven technologies, let us go. We'll go go do the research for the departments and present the data for them so they can evaluate it. Uh, so I wouldn't say there's hurdles, there's more just a lack of knowledge. We have a question from one of the uh, audience members uh, that asked specifically, is the authority considering life cycle uh, assessment along with life cycle cost analysis in the uh, approach to sustainability? Oh, absolutely. So everything uh, we do, it's, uh, we wanna make sure that the life cycle costs and we understand that sometimes the upfront cost for some of these uh, may cost more uh, the initial capital cost being more. Uh, so we want to do the life cycle cost to, to show to our leadership that, yes, uh, the upfront cost may be uh, a little higher, but there is a crossover point or there's a return on investment after X number of years that uh, reduce maintenance, reduce energy costs, that this is the right decision. Uh, and, and we see that. Another uh, uh, audience participation question is, uh, how is the solar project being done so as not to cause negative glare impact to aircraft? So we've done a glare analysis, uh, glare study. Uh, at, at, when on an airport, we work very closely with FAA. FAA has standards. 
Uh, we've already done that analysis. We've presented that to FAA. They've already uh, approved uh, the location of the uh, solar panels. Um, here's, a, here's another great question. One I would love to hear the answer to. <laughs> Describe the journey with Dominion. Who initiated the dialogue? How did the conversation evolve? When do you expect PJM approval? Um, you know, I've had uh, uh, some some uh, interrelationships and uh, some workings with with Dominion. It's an in interesting entity to, to 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 move projects forward. What was your experience like? Um, timing is everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I think uh, we both. Um, just came together at the right time that um, we were looking for a partner. It, it actually went very smoothly. It, it was a simple phone call actually. That said, um, at the time, one of my deputies called at Dominion and said, hey, we're looking, uh, you guys are a provider. We have some opportunities. We think we'd like to sit down and talk to you of, uh, of doing a large solar project here. Uh, and they just so happened to be looking for a site uh, in the area. And so it, it, it was timing. Uh, yeah, from a, from a solar perspective, Dominion has published their, their, their goals on what they want to achieve as far as utilizing renewable energy and in particular solar and the incentives associated with that. So I think you're right. You, you, you were publishing your desire and they were publishing their goals and it married up uh, uniquely for, the, for this particular opportunity. Um, does the solar project cover 100% of the uh, uh, the airport's uh, utility requirements? Um, and is it integrating batteries into the design? It, 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 we are in, a, we've requested battery storage uh, for this project. Uh, Dominion is gonna be providing uh, battery storage. It does not provide 100% of the airport's uh, one, uh, because of the, uh, it's only available during the day and the battery storage won't be able to carry through the night. Uh, the part of uh, the location of the solar is, uh, as most people are aware, there, there's a lot of data centers going around Dulles. Uh, so a lot of those data centers, um, because of the big tech companies, want to use green uh, power. Uh, so we may not necessarily use the power directly with Dulles because there may be financially more advantageous for us and Dominion to put it on the grid and then sell it to uh, the, uh, the data centers and actually use it directly to us. Obviously, what we, we were to look, we'll look at is uh, different opportunities to be able to use this, possibly as emergency, you know, first right of refusal, if there's a uh, grid outage in the area, those types of things. Uh, but all those things are going to be discussed uh, as part of our negotiations on uh, what kind of uh, final deal we come to. Understood. Um, so any other questions from the audience for Roger directly related to his presentation? Uh, if not, we will move into our, our panel discussion. Let's give it one more second. Um, I don't see any new questions coming in on the presentation. Roger, thank you for that. Um, that was very insightful. Uh, so uh, with that, I think we will move towards our uh, panel discussion. Today we have um, some exceptional panel members who are gonna be participating in our discussion. Um, I'd like to uh, invite each of the panel members to give a few words about themselves. Um, and you know, based on the topic of our conversation, you know, sustainable infrastructure, sustainability, um, I'd like to get a perspective on each of your visions or views on what sustainability is to you. The definition really varies based on the people that you talk to. Um, so I think I'd like to get a, a bit of an understanding from everybody first on where you stand, and then we'll get into some, some discussions. We'll kick off the uh, introductions with uh, Robert Lazaro. He serves as the executive director of the Northern Virginia Regional Commission 
Uh, the Regional Commission is a consortium of 13 local, local, uh, leading local governments in the region. Uh, Bob, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your view on sustainability? Sure, Chuck. Uh, thank you. And uh, first, thank you to the uh, Dulles Area Chamber uh, for this opportunity, Committee for Dulles, on this opportunity to, to be with you today. Uh, appreciate telling uh, a good story about what our local governments are doing and also MWA. I'm executive director of the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, as you described, a consortium of 13 local governments here in Northern Virginia. Had the honor to serve as uh, mayor of the town of Percival uh, for eight years, two years on town council, worked in the environmental uh, arena, uh, working for the Piedmont Environmental Council, and also had the honor of moving to Virginia, working for then chairman Scott York of the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors. So Scott and I go back a, a bit of a way. Uh, really briefly on sustainability, to me, it's things that uh, initiatives or projects that have a positive impact on the triple bottom line, people, uh, the planet, and profit. And um, I think the, our local governments and MWA have a great record in, in, that er in those arenas. And um, one size doesn't fit all. And um, I think that uh, what we're doing at MWA and our local governments address those areas. Thank you, Bob. Also joining us today is Dr. Chris Lebon. Uh, he serves as the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Um, Chris, why don't you uh, give us a little bit about yourself and your view on sustainability? Yeah, th thank you so much, Chuck. And uh, again, thank you so much to MOA as well as to the uh, Committee on Dallas for, for inviting us here. You know, I come in here and on with with two hats at least. The you know, one as a the chair of the Committee on Sustainability for the American Society of Civil Engineers. You know, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, um, a very short thing about it, and then uh, as a chief sustainability officer for the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. You know, the transportation authority here uh, in the Los Angeles uh, County region. Uh, as ASCE chair of sustainability, you know, um, we look at building uh, the project right. Uh, but more importantly, building the right project, you know, and, and what that really means is, you know, uh, uh, echoing on what Bob had mentioned, you know, not only looking at, you know, um, the environmental uh, issues, not only looking at the equity issues, uh, but ensuring that, you know, over the life of that project, you know, uh, the uh, financial components and elements of, of that project actually make sense, you know, not only on the capital side, but on the operational side. So in the context, you know, um, uh, we have been looking at uh, sustainable infrastructure standard, uh, which is uh, which is in draft form right now, uh, and um, that will be a game changer, you know, uh, for uh, the construction uh, and design industry. You know, it's being uh, just uh, got balloted, uh, and we're looking through the uh, comments that we receive uh, globally. Uh, there's also a manual of practice on uh, procurement uh, that the committee is working on. Uh, that will suggest a uh, pretty much uh, significant amount of language that hopefully will be useful uh, for tenders as well as uh, or and or contracts uh, for, for other agencies like uh, MOA. Uh, certification is a key component uh, to uh, that uh, work uh, and uh, as well as um, you know incorporating you know climate change uh, information into the design. Uh, here in LA Metro uh, you know um, we consider transportation you know, as the backbone of our economy. And uh, in, in that context, you know, uh, we not only connect to the airports authority here, uh, LAWA in particular, Los Angeles World Airports, in thinking about, you know, how to deliver people, but ensuring that the impact of the projects are minimal and the impact of the environment on the projects uh, are also minimal so that we can uh, uh, enjoy the benefit uh, of uh, those projects, those capital infrastructures, you know, over your life. Uh, we can talk more about the details of those, but just some highlights uh, are related to your question, Chuck. Thank you. Um, and your vision on sustainability? Uh, yeah, it's, um, I alluded to it, and essentially, you know, uh, it's uh, sustainability and resiliency uh, go together, uh, and uh, building infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, you know, that uh, would create access for all. Thank you, Chris. Uh, also joining us today is uh, Lindsay Geiger, the Director of Education at the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure. 
Um, she oversees educational programming, uh, including the Envision Sustainability Professional Credential, um, continuing education courses and training for Envision verifiers and ISI trainers. Uh, Lindsay, tell us a little bit about yourself and your view on sustainability. Sure, so thank you. I am with the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure. Um, one of our founders so was the American Society of Civil Engineers. So we threw out all of our work. We, we weave through those, those main tenants that, that Chris was speaking to. Um, in my own, my own background, I come from um, work with the, the nonprofit sector. Um, so it really, um, uh, to hear Roger say that one of the, the main needs is education. You know, I've, I've got bias um, for education, being the director of education for ISI. Um, and so, and throughout my background, it's been a lot about stakeholder engagement, ensuring that um, whether in the construction sector or, or in the engineering sector, um, or even in the nonprofit sector, that people have the tools that they need to implement the, the projects the right way. Um, so my views on sustainability, it's really about having a thoughtful approach to implementing infrastructure systems um, for uh, the long term and going beyond balancing those aspects of um, economic impacts, social impacts and environmental impacts to ensure that those aspects can really thrive and serve the, the community and serve the overall goals of the project. Um, and at ISI, we've developed and we uh, implement the Envision framework to help decision makers make those right choices, um, make the sustainable choices to, toward increasing the, the performance of their projects. Thank you. So um, to get things started, I think I wanna kick off with a, with, a, with a question, bring Roger back into the discussion. Um, you know, Roger, prior to the pandemic, MWA was systematically reducing its cost for employment, CPE, to uh, you know, record levels, I guess, of below $15 per passenger. Um, the drop in travel obviously has significant impacts on the way uh, you're uh, or on, on, on CPE. Um, you know, as you look to the future uh, as travel, uh, hopefully returns back to normal and we all get into this more post-COVID uh, environment. Uh, what sustainability measures might be undertaken to, to recover that uh, original achievement that, that you had? Um, and, and what in particular do you have uh, you know, on your docket as how you're going to continue to inc improve that, that uh, key performance metric? Sure, I appreciate it. Um, so some of the things you know we did, the airports, uh, both the airports, the operational side, uh, it helped sustainability, uh, but it was also economics as simple things like bringing the parking in closer. We had remote parking lots, closing those, bringing those all in passengers and employees that reduce busing, obviously reduces greenhouse gases, uh, so there's a lot of these simple things you can do. They looked at uh, the escalators moving sidewalks. Can you shut those down at times uh, when there's less passengers? Do you need all of them going? Saves a lot of electricity, saves costs. Uh, but, but I think one of the, the big things that we're re really looking at, and I think it gets uh, missed a lot is, uh, it, as Chris mentioned it and, and Lindsay mentioned it too, not only education, but doing it right the first time uh, it's so if you're not reworking things uh, and in construction especially in a renovation or a new pro even a new product you hit a lot of unforeseen why because we don't document things correctly uh, things get put in wrong uh, instead of doing things right getting the documentation right so when we do a design when we uh, you can have the best laid out sustainable building but when you put that shovel in the ground the first time and say, what's this duck bank here? What's this line here? All of a sudden things become very inefficient in the construction. Uh, costs go up, energy uses go up, but that's all part of the, the sustainability of the, air, not only the airports, any facility. We got to get better at documenting not only GIS, but whether it's BIM models, 
So when we do these things, we're doing them right the first time. And when we put them in, we put them in the right first time. When we build something, we need to think about how are these, this area, how is this facility maybe changing over the next decade? As an example, parking structures. Parking structures today, people still drive. Hopefully they're gonna decrease, but we need the parking structures today. So when we build a parking structure, should we build the top floors taller? So it's an adaptive design. So in 10, 15 years, those two top floors, you can convert to retail office space and still have parking below because you're just not gonna need the, as much parking. Instead of having these low ceiling parkings that there's really nothing to do. And then you could have to demo them, rebuild, but all that's non-sustainable. That creates a lot of uh, pollution, uh, a lot of that, a lot of reworked material. So those are the kind of things I think. You know, I, I like Lindsay's. You know, the education part is we got to get people to think, not just for today but tomorrow. And the same with uh, what Chris is doing at LA. So I know it's a long answer. No, no, that's good. That's good. You know, it's, it, 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 it's funny, you know, being in this whole construction space, you know, there, are, there, there never seems to be, uh, or there, 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 there never seems enough to be enough time or money to do it right, but there always seems to be enough time and money to do it over. Uh, you know, and I, and I think we don't want to go down that path. And, 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 and Lindsay, maybe that's a good uh, intro to, to what you're doing with uh, Envision um, you know, how, how do you feel that Envision and, and the efforts of, uh, 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 that you're taking are supporting uh, this complex sustainability initiatives? Great question. And I, I love, Roger, that you brought up your example of the parking garage, because that's a, that's a really great example to highlight kind of the different things that Envision um, can be used to support. So it, it's about, and these cost savings, I think, will really amount to being able to embed that flexibility into the designs. And so the Envision framework is asking the right questions to say, well, you, have you thought about what car capacity will, will need to be 10 or 20 years down the line? Have you thought about, um, you know, not, you know, have you thought about, you know, are there going to be electrically fueled? Um, do you need charging stations there? And asking, Envision is, is about asking the right question so that you can can have that thoughtful approach to your, your implementation and also um, for the long term. So I'd like also, Roger, what you were saying about the, the documentation and um, bringing in what Chris was saying about building it right the first time. Um, Envision is also about making sure that you can build it right again when you need to build it again 30 years down the line. So have you, have you documented, um, have you monitored the impacts are you aware of any variables that have, have changed since the last time you had to build um, a project of this nature? So can you, can you pivot? Are you aware of the things that need to change when you do need to build it again um, to upgrade the system? Excellent. Um, Chris, question for you. LA Metro is uh, certainly making an impact on LA County. Um, through uh, sustainability and climate safe infrastructure. I found that was to be an, interest, an interesting uh, uh, description. What, what, what is climate safe infrastructure and how, uh, you know, what are the initiatives that LA Metro is taking um, to you know, provide uh, a sustainable impact? Yeah, thank you. And um, before I answer that question, Chuck, I just wanted to uh, say that um, you know, and, and, and maybe this is not obvious earlier, you know, uh, a lot of the things that Envision uh, is, is trying to do, Roger is, uh, is, is doing uh, without Envision. And that's really the, the good thing about the project, I think, that Roger's trying to do, that, you know, a lot of these uh, different um, uh, best practices are happening around the country. And, you know, uh, in, in terms of documenting those uh, best practices, I think the, the nexus there uh, of what uh, Lindsay is trying to do uh, relative to certification of those projects as well as you know, training those projects is, is allowing those, those practices to an envision framework for those to be documented so that other people can, can actually learn more 
uh, from them, you know, uh, similar to what we're trying to do here, you know, with, with our multiple uh, experiences on sustainable infrastructure. And going back to the, to the to the question, you know, the the term climate safe infrastructure really came out of um, a, a process that we had here in the state of California, wherein, you know, uh, the, the state legislature thought that uh, uh, climate information should be fully integrated, you know, into the design, uh, construction, operations, and maintenance, you know, of, of uh, state infrastructure. And, you know, being part of uh, uh, the practitioner group, you know, we had the academic group and the practitioner group, you know, uh, uh, come together, you know, for a full year of, of thinking and, and actually designing how that might look mm -hmm. like here in the state. You know, being part of the practitioner group, uh, I was able to uh, not only learn uh, from the climate scientists on what's challenging them, you know, uh, models are always changing, you know, and, and so therefore, you know, what might be appropriate now to incorporate into the design, you know, will change again, you know, in the next six uh, months to a year and maybe even five years. And so in, in a context, you know, going back to the term, you know, climate safe infrastructure is not only uh, describing you know, uh, how a particular infrastructure could be uh, sustainable and resilient um, and, and built in the most equitable way now. But as new information and climate uh, comes up, that, you know, the jurisdiction like ours should be, if it's a if climate safe infrastructure is a policy, should be open, you know, to incorporating new information into future design and then allowing those that have been built earlier you know, uh, to, to actually get retrofitted with the new information. Uh, and, and this is um, really at the, at the heart of uh, a term called flexible adaptive, uh, flexible design or adaptive design. That, you know, and, and similar to what Roger uh, is talking about earlier, uh, you know, um, we, we have been incorporating uh, uh, those uh, scientific information uh, along with the codes and standards that's available to us, you know, so that um, these, uh, 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 infrastructure we're building here uh, would remain relevant, you know, at the same time functional, despite, you know, uh, the, the stressors that we're uh, continually facing here. And then uh, the, the other part of this too is uh, this mm -hmm. context of um, how uh, these projects are funded, you know, having a climate safe infrastructure framework, you know, uh, allows us to uh, think about how do we actually monetize, you know, uh, some of these uh, decarbonization efforts, you know, uh, and, you know, as, as we monetize these decarbonization efforts, you know, uh, how do we reinvest it back, you know, uh, to future infrastructure we build here. You know, I'm obviously leaving a lot of, uh, a lot of details there, but um, the framework really is uh, looking at data, having the data guide the design, construction, operation, maintenance over life cycle, and allowing, you know, the environmental benefits maintained over time produce some monetizable values for your investment. That's a great point. The, the monetization of sustainability is an interesting topic that uh, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about uh, and we'll bring it back in, in, in the future. But one of the other things that has been happening, you know, there's been a lot of interesting projects that have been going on in that Northern Virginia area, and particularly uh, uh, local, local, uh, local governments in the Northern Virginia area have, have undertaken um, some very innovative projects to increase the amount of renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, you know, as integrated into the part of the Virginia community, what can uh, MWA learn from uh, local governments in the region? And I guess that's to you, Bob. You know, what is it that, you know, is special about Northern Virginia and the local governments and the initiatives that they're taking? And how can that translate to the initiatives that uh, Roger has outlined in his presentation? Our, our um, local governments are, are doing some really innovative stuff around solar, around electric buses. And uh, there are two areas that I, I think the authority can learn from is power purchase agreements. Fairfax just did a power purchase agreement for over 100 facilities with cost savings over time of 60 million. Arlington Public Schools has now two net zero schools well on their third. Two of them are using PPA power purchase agreements for their solar. Uh, the electric buses are, are about partnerships. Uh, Dominion Energy is financing electric school buses here with the opportunity in the future to use them for, for storage to put back into the grid. 
And uh, Loudoun County Public Schools are, are using an ESCO to do solar, which I think is a unique opportunity for us to consider in terms of energy efficiency and LED retrofit in, in many of our facilities. So I, I do think that their approach to some of these issues um, lend some educational opportunities for MWA and vice versa. I think uh, Roger and, and Jack and the team should be very proud of the sustainability plan, the corporate social responsibility report we just put out on the things that we're doing at MWA that the local governments can learn from. And, and I, I think to Roger's point, plan, plan, and plan. Uh, have a plan in place first before you do a, a one-off here or there. It may get you a nice headline in the newspaper on the one-off, but there, there needs to be follow-up. And I think the sustainability plan uh, provides a great framework for our local government partners to look at. Uh, Fairfax County is redoing uh, their community energy plan. Loudoun County has one and is looking to redo it. A number of our local governments have them as well. So uh, it's an exciting time uh, for local governments and for MWA to learn from each other. You know, the, um, the, the ability to, to see the future doesn't exist in, in, in any of our technologies today. Uh, you know, Roger, I think, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the theory or the thought that you want to uh, have parking lots that can be, um, you know, modified for future use to improve sustainability. But we all know that uh, the plans that we lay now are usually changed a million times between uh, you know here and there. Uh, what how, how do how do we introduce flexibility into our sustainable planning? You know what are the things that we need to do? And I guess this is a question that's open to the whole panel: is you know how do we make sustainability planning flexible enough to account for advances that are going to be coming in you know in in the future that we don't even know about yet? Uh, you know as as we all uh, you know. Uh, earned our stripes uh, since, you know, the, the 80s and 90s. I mean, when I go back to when I first started doing this, there wasn't even, there wasn't even the internet, you know, and, and, and look at the evolution that we have to where we're at now. I don't think we can even predict where we're going to go in the future. So how do we account for flexibility and sustainability as we go forward? Who wants to kick that off? I'll make a comment on that. So, um, and part of it is, it's collectively the industry. If we have to continue to have these discussions uh, as an industry, uh, so for the airports, like for particularly in the airport, what we did last year uh, here at MWA is um, internally, and we got one of our consultants, and we said, "Hey, give us an idea of all the future technologies that uh, are out there that are, are being tested." Uh, people are imagining out. And we actually put together what I consider a pretty nice refund airports of the future. Things like, so talking about parking, uh, parking's going to change, even for people bringing their vehicles. Uh, there's not going to, for um, uh, valet parking, it's going to be a robot that you're going to drive your car on a sled uh, it's, or a tug. They're already doing it in Japan. So parking structures decrease because you don't need all that space. Uh, you can decrease the footprint, even parking. Baggage systems are going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of autonomous vehicles for baggage systems. You're already starting to see that being developed. Uh, instead of these tugs and people, uh, you're going to have autonomous vehicles moving the baggage. Instead of bag belts, that take up a lot of space and are very expensive, a lot of right-of-ways. Uh, there's gonna be probably individual, smaller uh, uh, baggage that may even come directly to your car. And you put your bag in right at your car and it goes away and it shows up, maybe delivered to your car on the other side uh, or at the curb individually. So those are the kind of things we have to kind of imagine and think about how are we gonna build the buildings that, uh, and the ramps and all the moving pieces of an airport uh, to accommodate some of these things. It is vertical lift, vertical taxis, the Uber lift, is that gonna be viable? What are we gonna do? How do we get to handle that? And we have to make some assumptions 
on that. So it is challenging, but I, but I think uh, it, it's, it requires education, it requires us talking amongst ourselves a lot. Yep. That's my... Yeah, I want to piggyback on what Roger's uh, last point there is, you know, um, we have been working with Lindsay and, and ISI in really investing, you know, in our communities here um, uh, relative to, you know, uh, making people aware uh, of what sustainability and resiliency is, uh, having uh, tools available, uh, not only to our staff, uh, but for our communities. Uh, here to, um, I'll borrow Roger's word, imagine or reimagine, you know, uh, uh, the the city, the transportation system, and, you know, how sustainability and resiliency uh, get incorporated, you know, into those into those concepts. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning that because, you know, at the, at the core of, of all of these uh, is, you know, uh, COVID, this, this pandemic, you know, has really turned over its, uh, our, our, our status quo over its head, you know, the way that we plan things, the way that we look at things, you know, uh, uh, as crazy as, you know, um, the thought before uh, that transportation funding, for example, you know, uh, could be redirected to strengthening the 5G network. Back in 2019, December 2019, that was just uh, such heresy, you know, uh, but now look, look at what's going on, you know, um, uh, one of our jurisdictions here, the South Bay Council of Governments, you know, uh, we 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 LA Metro, you know, uh, had um, uh, authorized uh, you know a few million dollars, you know, uh, of transportation funding uh, to actually strengthen you know the the internet and 5G network down there. And we're also looking at you know repurposing, you know, some of uh, uh, the existing infrastructure uh, that we have here, uh, so that you know. If indeed, you know, telecommuting uh, is going to be the norm uh, in in the in, in the future, uh, in transportation systems, you know, uh, are, are going to be the supplement uh, to to that norm versus the other way around. Uh, ready for that, right? Uh, so, so that's one part. The other part of this is, you know, uh, the transition. Uh, the transition uh, is, is very critical uh, in, in in thinking about and future proofing you know, what we build now. There's a lot of investments that we put in the ground, uh, you know, to, to make sure that the purpose of the infrastructure is actually accomplished, you know, and, you know, uh, this, this, these conditions of climate and extreme weather events, you know, uh, are, are just exacerbating the, the point that, you know, these infrastructures might not uh, uh, be, uh, be here, you know, uh, if we uh, retain and remain doing the status quo. And so, therefore, you know, I just wanted to offer out there that, you know, uh, a transition uh, um, does not necessarily mean, you know, uh, an overall technology or a best practice is applicable across the board, you know, but um, having that kind of awareness uh, um, on what, you know, climate change and its impacts might mean uh, to the community, you know, developing culturally sensitive solutions. Uh, as well as adapted solutions to those communities, you know, would really assist, you know, in, in envisioning, you know, uh, what, um, you know, future-proofed uh, sustainable infrastructure might look like. And the last point I just wanted to, to, to mention here uh, is that um, the powers in the people, you know, uh, um, it, it, it's public, you know, we have a structural uh, fiscal deficit here, about a billion dollars this fiscal year can only do so much, you know, uh, but, you know, allowing, you know, uh, the community to actually contribute to the conversation, you know, similar to what, for example, Bob had been doing this, uh, and, and to some extent, Rogers has been doing in their, in their, in their organizations, allowing those voices to be heard in there more actively and, and really tempering the expectations at the same time, you know, uh, could produce really innovative results, you know, as we've been seeing here in Los Angeles. You make a good point, Chris, that, uh, you know, uh, and, and that was one of the other things that I, that I wanted to point out is, you know, we have had some, some hard hits to the economy lately. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, of, of, of businesses are struggling, um, not the least of which, you know, the hospitality industry, the travel industry is taking a massive hit. Um, 
So we all know from our own experience that there is a premium associated with, with some of these sustainability initiatives. You know, my question is, you know, can we afford not to consider sustainability and how do we, you know, uh, uh, how do we, how do we account for the premium? What are your thoughts on, on the, the premium associated with sustainability initiatives and how do we, how do we move this forward? Because I think it really does become imperative uh, to our, you know, our, our, our world that we're making steps in the right directions. And that's open to the whole panel as well. Who wants to kick that one off? Hey, kick that off. Cause I, I think it's um, the answer to that really comes back to something you said earlier, Chuck, where we can't seem to afford to be able to do things right the first time, but we can afford to do them over. So <laughs> the, that's the premium that you're talking about is do we want to have thoughtful projects that will last us for the long term? We're going to put in a little bit of um, extra. I'm saying extra because it's it's truly not a premium if you consider the full life cycle of that project um, or the full life cycle of that infrastructure system overall and being able to forecast what um, will be needed within that infrastructure system so that you're not having to do it over again. Um, I think that's where the the premiums will, will see them dissipate is that if we're doing things in a thoughtful way and we're not having to redo our work um, you know, five, 10 years before we're, we're truly due for upgrades of the system, um, then those, those premiums, those perceived premiums will, will dissipate across the overall uh, lifetime and the overall project costs, I think. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, certainly, Roger, in your example, you know, if you have a parking lot that can be turned into an office building that can eventually be turned into, you know, a, uh, a condo, <laughs> uh, you know, and reusing that same structure and infrastructure, that you know that that's a brilliant life cycle of you know a piece of property. If you look what's going on in the District of Columbia right now, a lot of the office space is now being transitioned into um, uh, apartment and condos because of telecommuting. You know, people aren't going back to the offices. I don't think anybody ever did that uh, with any forethought. So now it's a it's more of a, a retrofit initiative. Um, Bob, Chris, or Roger, you want to add to that, uh, that that topic of discussion? I mean, it, I just, as a former elected official had on, I mean, right-sizing your infrastructure and just thinking past your next election is critically important. I mean, that, that, that's the real cost of some of this stuff is, you know, having to redo it because it wasn't done correctly the first time. I, I had personal experience in the community where I live. We built a sewer plant prior to my service that didn't meet the new mandates of the Chesapeake Bay Act. So guess who had to resize and re, uh, re, redo the plant uh, because it didn't meet the requirements of its permit. Uh, so it's, it's those kinds of things. It's, it's thinking past today or 10 years or 20 years. And a lot of our local governments now are looking at it. Stormwater is a big issue with our local governments. 20 years ago, the pipe that was 48 inches uh, in diameter is probably the not, not the right pipe anymore because of the intensity, duration, and frequency of the, of, of the impact of climate change on rainfall. So um, it's really systematically rethinking what you're doing. Chris, you're still on mute. Uh, moving lips uh, without sound is bad. Uh, um, I'll approach that question a couple of ways, Chuck. So uh, first one is, you know, um, just approaching it head on, you know, uh, the question head on in terms of, uh, is this really a premium, right? You know, the mantra here in ASCE is, you know, um, not only doing uh, the, the project right, but doing the right project, right? And, and, and piggyback on, on, piggybacking on Lindsay's point earlier, you know, uh, uh, doing the, the right project, uh, and, and allowing, you know, uh, all of the elements to gel together, you know, uh, both in the community, the infrastructure itself, the function, you know, whole life cycle and the benefits of that project gel together on the front end. And, um, uh, and, and, and one of those, uh, again, tools, we, I can't emphasize this enough because we use it here, you know, uh, um, for documentation purposes specifically, is this envision framework, right? 
um, and, and allowing that, you know, and, and, and having that kind of record, you know, guide, you know, any future projects uh, in, in, in doing the right project as well as doing the project right, which is you know, on time and, and within schedule. Uh, the second point I just wanted to, to, uh, to make there is that um, uh, we're, we're lucky here in, in the state of California to have the political will uh, to actually create you know, uh, a market uh, in terms of you know, uh, carbon credits uh, and, and similar uh, and, and allowing you know, organizations like myself you know, to look uh, for uh, multiple different ways, you know, on, on how, you know, these, uh, for example, uh, carbon credits, you know, uh, that, that we generate from, from some of our efforts here could be sold to actually reduce, to actually be reinvested, you know, those proceeds to be reinvested back, you know, uh, into, uh, into our, our infrastructure projects. But, you know, for many parts of the country, it doesn't exist, right? And so therefore, uh, the point I'm trying to make there with, with the California experience is that, you know, for other jurisdictions like MY and, and Northern Virginia and, and some other jurisdictions uh, uh, that, that our, our audience here is, 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 is operating in, you know, maybe there's an opportunity there for, you know, uh, looking at um, uh, you know, uh, alternative forms of funding and financing, you know, uh, green bonds, uh, resiliency bonds, you know, uh, sustainability bonds, those are out there. Uh, that, you know, if uh, there is um, a, a framework of, because of that so alternative form of funding and financing, accelerating, you know, uh, the project uh, that is built right uh, to, to benefit the community faster and better. Some of these, you know, uh, uh, benefits, you know, uh, reduce mortality and morbidity, you know, think, uh, and, and similar things that have not been measured, you know, alongside with this infrastructure, you know, uh, might be a good point, you know, to, to emphasize to the policymakers. Last but not the least, you know, uh, again, uh, this, this whole pandemic has turned our thinking over, over its head. And because of the limited financial resources that we have here, you know, uh, collaboration and cooperation with other jurisdictions is key. You know, uh, the, the term that's floating around here for many, many months now, and we have, we have executed on is co-benefits, right? Uh, a clear example that I, I can point out to you is that, you know, a couple of our utility companies here uh, have uh, had grants, you know, uh, that they give to organizations like myself and say, and, and, if, and if we can, build a transportation project, for example, that has, you know, infiltration capacity into the aquifer, then they could provide some capital funding, you know, into our project, uh, you know, and, and that, that, that infiltration capacity into an aquifer that only solves, you know, my stormwater issue uh, to some degree, but at the same time, it's just, it uh, replenishes, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the aquifer for portable uh, purposes. So creative things, you know, uh, uh, are, are out there. And it's really a matter of, uh, I, I think, you know, for, for many of us, whether you're a policymaker or you're an engineer or a project manager, you know, um, uh, I think Roger said this earlier, you know, uh, on, on Dominion experience, just reach out, you know. Uh, maybe there's something out there uh, that people are just wanting to talk about and have not really had the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to talk about because no one has reached out to them uh, because they're not aware that the other party is also uh, hungry, you know, for new and innovative ideas. Uh, on that note, Bob, how can, uh, how, how can the, the local governments, uh, you know, incentivize sustainability? I think that, you know, as, a, as elected officials, they want uh, betterment for all. That's their, their, their sole objective is to get their constituents, you know, and to, and to improve the lives of their constituents. How is the local governments uh, and the affiliations that you're working with in Northern Virginia supporting sustainability? Well, I mean, uh, there's a diff a d a many different approaches to it. I, I would say one with the private sector, a number of our local governments are doing it through zoning. The, the more energy efficient your building is, the more density and height you get for your project. And, and Arlington uses density bonuses based upon LEED certification, et cetera. We also have uh, our, our local governments looking at them, what their own operations are internally, 
uh, NVRC worked with Dominion Energy on reducing the cost of LED streetlight uh, renovation here in, um, in Northern Virginia. Fairfax County alone will see a return on investment after three or four years of over $2 million a year. And so there's, there, there's that opportunity. Education is key. I mean, the, the ter terms that Roger and, and Lindsay have talked about is informing people about what's, what's available to them. Our utilities, Washington Gas, Dominion Energy, all offer uh, very generous opportunities to make one's home more energy efficient. And uh, it's about educating the public about those. I got to tell you, um, that some of my work, personal work here is around energy efficiency. And it's incredibly hard to get people to understand that these programs are really free and that they're not an opportunity, that someone's not looking to rip them off uh, and, and break something in their house and charge them uh, an extra nickel or dime because something was, it was not a straight deal. So it, there's, there's a lot of different things that are, our local governments are doing. And, and last but not least, they're all looking at their planning. You know, uh, Fairfax is redoing their climate plan. Loudoun is looking to redo their climate plan because they see opportunities uh, to save money they're all looking at their own facilities. Fairfax County has more Energy Star schools than any school system in the country. Loudoun is probably pretty close right behind them. They've made that commitment uh, to sustainability and, and improving their facilities. And last but not least, and I'm sorry, I'm filibustering a little bit here. Most, several of our local governments have uh, approved uh, property assessed clean energy uh, ordinances where uh, a project may not pencil out using traditional financing. So by using uh, PACE financing, they can uh, put, pay it out a longer period of time and make it pencil out a little bit earlier than if they use traditional uh, commercial financing. So uh, I'm very positive about things happening in Virginia. The Chris's point, Virginia's joined Reggie. Uh, those, part those monies, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, those monies are going to go back into energy efficiency. And so uh, it's really exciting time here in the Commonwealth. Yeah, so there's a good uh, question that came in from the audience. Uh, how do we best educate customers and other key stakeholders to consider the value of sustainability, uh, looking at alternate costs rather than just assuming uh, the solution? Uh, you know, that education component is, I think, critical. Uh, you know, how, how do we best do that for the panel? I, I, I can just say, I think it's partnership of the public and the private. It has to be, be both folks. And, you know, um, Jack and Roger and others from EMWA are very um, proactive in telling the story. You know, EMWA has a $23.6 billion economic impact in the region. $160 million was spent last year with uh, disadvantaged businesses uh, in the region. So it's continuing to tell the story. And that's why events like this, Chuck, I'm thankful to Jack and the organization, because we, there is a great story to tell in the region. And we just got to continue to do it with events like this. Lindsay, do you see platforms like Envision documenting the successes and making that an element of the education process because you know when people understand that you know sustainability is you know not just good but good for you uh you know that you understand that you know if you look at it from a life cycle perspective and holistic perspective that it has advantages that you may not be accounting for in your traditional accounting models does does envision support that documentation process Oh, absolutely. It supports not only the documentation process, but enhancing that stakeholder engagement process itself. So, so that stakeholder engagement becomes not only educational for, for the public stakeholders, but it becomes a two-way street of education. You know, assuming, you know, our general public, we're all adults here. We have ideas and experiences of our own. So when you are implementing stakeholder engagement, you want to open up not just delivery of information, not to say, you know, this is sustainable for you because it crosses off this box, this box, and this box, but you need to open that channel of communication to say, what would be, what would be, what do you think would be good for you in this community? You live here, you want to live and work here. What are your needs? And being able to bring those stakeholders in 
earlier in the decision making processes so that you are not only educating them about what you're trying to achieve with the project, but they're educating you on what their their needs are overall. And I think the Envision framework certainly supports and, and encourages that by laying out best practices for uh, stakeholder engagement that moves beyond just the, the traditional town hall where here's what we're going to do. Anybody have any questions? Nope. Okay, let's, we'll see you at the next meeting. But really bringing in your stakeholders, bringing in the general public as far as um, partners in the decision making process and making sure because the infrastructure where the infrastructure systems are intended to serve them so so why not make sure they're part of that process so that it is meeting their needs so just building on what Lenny said you know the communication plan is really important on getting people to understand how this affects them directly and I, I'm going to revert to my military experience so when I was in the Pentagon uh, in the last two administrations ago, when we were really pushing uh, renewables and energy, I remember talking to my boss, Ray May, who was the Secretary of the Navy at the time, telling them, sir, whatever you do, when we talk about renewables, don't talk about environmental. Talk about how this is making the, the warrior more combat effective. Then they'll accept it. Things like you know, and I would joke with them. I'd say, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, I remember being at a naval station in Pearl Harbor, and we were talking about ships coming in from overseas that would have invasive species attached to the ships and we were concerned, what are we going to do? How do we clean these things? We have invasive species coming into Pearl Harbor. And I tell them, but if you tell the warfighter, hey, if we clean your ships off and keep a coating on to keep these critters off of it, you get 2% extra fuel, uh, your combat radius goes up, then they get excited about it. You know, the Marines, when you talk about photovoltaics and renewable batteries, well, when, when the SEALs and the Marines are out on patrol, they're humping 70 pounds of, uh, on their back. A third of that is batteries. It's food, ammunition, and batteries. <clears throat> and they have to hump those batteries out because you can't bury uh, those batteries. One, from an environmental school, I don't want them to bury, but two, uh, from a security, you don't want the bad guys to know where you were hiding and watching them. So they actually have to hump that out. So you, when you tell them, well, the reason we're developing renewables and photovoltaics renewable, you don't have to carry so many batteries, you can carry more ammunition, you can carry more food, then they get excited about it and uh, about why renewables are important from an environmental, from the sustainability, that's where I'm not only concerned about their combat effectiveness, but also making it more environmentally friendly. So those are kind of examples of, I, I think we have to be able to communicate to people of why this is the right thing for them uh, and not just because it's good for the environment, it's good for the greenhouse gas emissions. But that's just a little bit too esoteric for folks. <laughs> Uh, I agree. You know, mo most people don't really consider anything until it impacts them. They don't care about the cost of water until they can't get it. Yep. And then they're willing to pay whatever they wh whatever the amount is necessary for them to have clean water. So, I mean, you know, I think the vision of sustainability has to be personal. It has to hit home mm -hmm. in order for people to act on it, to make a decision on it. Yep. And then... And, and uh, the, just to add on to that really quickly, Chuck, I know we, we have limited time here, but uh, the thing is, uh, uh, we have been partnering with, with Lindsay and ISI in, in really like bringing down the, 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 the context of sustainability uh, and resiliency to, to a level uh, that's not only understandable to you know, the technical folks, uh, but to our stakeholders at the same time. And in fact, you know, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, people will be calling Lindsay after after this to, to learn more. Uh, in fact, we have uh, worked with them to reinvent, you know, the the the, the uh, Envision program, you know, uh, on on uh, allowing uh, that uh, the kind of framework to permeate through. And so, you know, uh, uh, we've made investments, you know, uh, to train, you know, our finance folks, for example, you know, our uh, inspector general of all the groups here in LA Metro. You know uh, NGOs, uh, 
students, you know, and, and allowing those individuals to have some grounded understanding, you know, to Roger's point, understand, grounded understanding and common understanding of what is really sustainability and resiliency, and then go from there, right? Uh, allow the common understanding to, to bring those people together so that solutions that are applicable and relevant to that community could come up, you know, during those conversations. And, you know, you bring up a, a good point there and a, a word that kind of jumped out at me, which we haven't talked about yet, has been resiliency. Um, you know, resiliency and sustainability, in my opinion, need to go hand in hand. And just for fun, I'm going to throw a hand grenade in the room here because my personal view of sustainability uh, and resiliency involves a carbon future for the for for the for for the foreseen uh, for the foreseeable future, um, you know, uh, I, I, with Pannoni Engineering, uh, I personally myself am responsible for our, our distributed generation and the growth of our distributed generation uh, design build efforts, which includes on-site power generation, combined heat and power um, that use a fossil fuel. Um, you know, eventually we could be moving towards a hydrogen economy, but for the foreseeable future, I see natural gas as a, a key component in sustaining or in developing a bridge to that sustainable future that we all seek. Um, I think that, you know, there's just not enough acreage to put solar panels everywhere they need to be. And at night, the batteries aren't big enough to support what we need to do. So in the immediate future, you know, I see us using carbon as an interim resource to get us to where we need to be. But I would like the thoughts of each of you on the panel on what your perspective is about a carbon, uh, about how carbon will uh, impact us or will be utilized in the foreseeable future. Who wants to volunteer to go first? Yeah, there lies the challenge actually, you know, uh, of us here, you know, we made a commitment to do uh, permissions buses, you know, uh, 10 years ahead of the mandate for the state of California. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, just going back to your point um, and what I uh, alluded to earlier, what does the transition look like? You know, uh, I have the largest, uh, already the largest clean, na clean natural gas fleet in the whole country. It's right? second only to China, to Beijing in particular, in the world. And, you know, um, uh, we've spent $250 million uh, in retrofitting our uh, uh, gas compression facilities, you know, to make it to transition us from diesel to compressed natural gas uh, uh, propulsion power, you know, uh, and, and now, you know, uh, you know, maybe up to, you know, uh, uh, at least a billion dollars transition from where we are uh, to a uh, zero emissions bus future. Uh, what I'm really trying to say there, going back to point, is that, you know, um, in, in looking at these investments and in looking at all of these, um, uh, at this path towards a carbon neutral future, you know, it's not necessarily bad to think about, you know, what might be a renewable source of a carbon intense propulsion power. And in, in, in this particular case, you know, yeah, there's some emissions on the buses, but, you know, uh, we're using renewable natural gas, right? Uh, we've, we've been, trying to um, uh, create more of that market. And at the same time, you know, allowing us to, uh, to, to work through uh, the workforce development issues, you know, the infrastructure issues, you know, uh, part of the conversation there is how do we actually use now, you know, and repurpose, you know, um, the CNG facilities, you know, uh, into maybe uh, energy generating you know, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, to supplement our our needs. You know, for for some of our bus depots and, and rail and rail depots, for example, right? Uh, and, and at the same time, creating you know um, the, the infrastructure for ZEVs. So uh, the point I'm trying to make there uh, is is quite, uh, um, uh, I guess, straightforward. You know, um, and that is, you know, we should not be afraid to talk about you know. Uh, that there's still a need, you know, for uh, uh, carbon intense fuels. But, you know, despite that, we need to be open to the fact that, you know, we, we should move to a carbon free future. And, you know, uh, we need to uh, essentially reconcile, you know, what that 
uh, transition and how the future might look like, given the limited resources we have uh, to actually build the infrastructure for that transition. So just to build on what Chris said, uh, since we're an airport, um, the, the tier one emissions, you know, we, we can, what we generate at the airport, uh, we probably can get there. Uh, we're gonna be using uh, sources that rely on carbon for a while, but we can transition. The tough part is we're an airport. Airplanes, uh, and they're gonna produce and, and our passengers coming via vehicles or whatever they're coming in will be producing carbons and we have less control over that. Uh, but the, uh, until we transition carbon capture, uh, it's gonna be, something that's probably gonna need to be stepped up. Uh, United Airlines has made a commitment. Uh, you know, they're a big airline. They wanna be carbon neutral. They're gonna invest in carbon capture. Uh, it's not just for Dulles, but their entire network. Uh, there's technologies out there that not actually eliminates carbon uh, as a fuel in the short term or even medium term, but are there technologies out there that we're going to have to invest in, such as United is going to do, that that captures the carbon and uh, just kind of controls what we produce? Until there are more uh, technologies out there that we don't produce the carbon. Lindsay or Bob, you want to add to that? Well, sure. I think um, Chris and Roger both pinged on the the important word here is that it's it's transition a carbon free future isn't going to happen overnight so we shouldn't pretend like it will so we need to prepare ourselves and we need to prepare ourselves to be working in this transitional phase in a, a thoughtful way and in the envision framework isn't about passing judgment over types of projects but it's rather providing context to make those thoughtful smart decisions about your project in a sustainable way to enhance the overall performance of, of your project, whether it's natural gas or whether it's uh, solar or wind power. Um, and it lays out the full, full landscape of things to consider. And I, I liked what Chris was talking about because we're talking about um, transition of of your fleet, but you also need workforce development. So what is, you know, how does the transition to a carbon-free future impact the, the workforce? Um, so we have um, folks that are uh, used to working with uh, traditional uh, carbon fossil fuel based vehicles. What is What do we need to do to educate them on um, maintenance and upkeep of electric vehicles as, a, as kind of a simplified example? So you have to have all of those pieces in consideration while we're in this this transitional phase, and we can't, um, you know, we can't move forward thinking that this will happen overnight. But we have to prepare for this kind of transitional phase. I, I would just, uh, I agree. It's transitional. Uh, Virginia legislature passed the Virginia Clean Economy Act. It has uh, carbon-free uh, electricity generation for our region, for the Dominion Service Territory by 2045, 2050 for uh, Appalachian uh, utility down in Southwest Virginia. So it definitely is a, is a transition. And to Lindsay's point around workforce, there's some colleges already here in Virginia doing uh, wind energy technician training. There's one down in Martinsville, New College Institute just has a certified program where you uh, you train on a, obviously indoor, but a, a type of wind turbine um, uh, facility where you can get some safety and first aid training, safety uh, training. So it's coming, but it is, it is a matter of time. It, the spigot doesn't get shut off tomorrow because someone said it's a good idea. There's an interesting question that came from a panel member here that says the, the charging an electric vehicle takes a considerable amount of, uh, of energy. A facility such as Amazon charging 50 or more vehicles at the same time is actually going to require a service increase from the power company. So how does this reduce their carbon footprint if the power company is creating more power using coal or natural gas, et cetera, to satisfy this demand? Um, it's an interesting dichotomy, right? Because yeah. As we move to that direction, we need more power to do it. And 
as I said before, you know, there's just not enough acreage for all the solar that we'd need. What are your guys' thoughts? I, I, I mean, Dominion's already committed to closing its coal-fired plants, so that's happening uh, here. Uh, we get 2.6 gigawatts of wind that are going off the shore, of the, the, the single largest um, wind facility in, in federal waters uh, off the Atlantic. Uh, so uh, I, I, I appreciate the question. I have an electric car. I have solar panels on my house. So I, I hope that I get a little bit of juice from those when I charge it up. Uh, but uh, Dominion Energy is already committed to uh, carbon-free uh, electricity generation. And, it's, and I think it's gonna happen sooner than later. What, what is their deadline? Do you know? Did they actually publish a deadline of when they want to be carbon free? Uh, 20, uh, I, uh, Virginia Clean Economy Hack has it as 2045. 2045. That's yeah. a far away. Yep, yep. Dave, I'm going to add to that. You know, the 20, and, and you know, this question is, I think, very insightful on two fronts. One is, you know, um, the, the visual, right, of, of what uh, zero emissions. Uh, future might look like, um, you know, uh, that energy has to come from somewhere, right? Uh, and um, the the vehicle might not have any emissions, you know, visible to the immediate, uh, you know, neighbors there. Uh, but the people who are, you know, going back to the question, the people where the, the um, uh, energy is being generated, you know, uh, uh, might be impacted. Um, and, and, you know, just weaving in uh, the earlier co conversation, you know, the, right before this question that you had here, you know, there, there's also the equity piece uh, in, in all of this, right, um, uh, uh, on, on, on a couple of fronts. One is, you know, on, on the operational front, you know, um, would uh, there be enough, you know, of uh, uh, a, a zero emissions, uh, uh, transportation system, for example, or uh, zero emissions sources of energy, uh, so that you know there will be a prioritization of, of those uh, installations in communities where are which are impacted, you know, uh, by uh, unclean uh, or carbon intensive uh, um, you know energy uh, production. Uh, that that's one point. A lot of those communities, you know, they have very limited land, you know. Uh, uh, cities have grown around them, and you know, um, uh, are, are are those continually uh, uh, going to benefit? You know, uh, from this, um, you know, as as those uh, infrastructures get dismantled uh, uh, towards a carbon free future. And the second one is, you know, the operational ability uh, uh, of of the entity that's using, um, you know, this this uh, carbon free future. Right? Uh, I I come. Uh, to that question in the context of, you know, um, uh, is there enough propulsion power from renewable sources to actually ensure service, especially to those transit dependent populations uh, can continue. And what I mean by that is uh, batteries can only, you know, hold so much juice or electricity in them. And, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, my system here, and whether we connect to the airport or not, you know, uh, needs to go in multiple directions, uh, needs to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, transferred over to uh, larger, uh, to, to, to uh, farther areas, you know, across the region. And, you know, those buses uh, and, and those trains need, need, need to function, you know, uh, um, uh, especially the bus need to function, you know, uh, as we transfer them to, to larger distances and, you know, uh, batteries are, are not there yet, you know, uh, to ensure that the um, uh, service that we're currently providing, you know, uh, could actually be met by zero emissions uh, vehicles. I think one of the, uh, one of the components that um, also should be addressed when we're thinking of broader planning is the aspect of um, reduction of consumption to begin with. So um, it's, it's not only important to transition to renewable fuels and renewable sources of resources, but we also need to reduce our consumption to begin with. And we've seen, I think, a lot of localized success within the water sector um, with conservation um, campaigns. So 
I uh, spent some time in Denver and every summer um, Denver water would say, hey, don't water your lawns from, you know, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. because, you know, we need to conserve water. And so had great success with um, local conservation campaigns. And I think the energy sector um, can be shifted with that same mindset of how, especially, especially now in, um, in a pandemic, we are relying so much less on our vehicles. Um, we are relying so much le uh, less on other energy sources. So how can we carry those those behavioral changes through into the future so that we are, um, so that, you know, the net result is that we have a, a reduction in our reliance on energy sources to begin with. So um, again, kind of big picture, we're what our, our planning needs to encompass not only the, the source and the quality of the source of our, our fuels, but also our uh, reduction of our reliance on them to begin with. You know, it's, it's an interesting, uh, this conversation has really kind of uh, spawned additional thought because sometimes people get very narrow minded on sustainability, right? And what sustainability is, oh, well, we have to, we have to generate electricity using solar or wind, but it is so much broader than that. It's, it's, it's our materials of construction. It's our other natural resources that impact us on our daily life, like clean water. One of the initiatives that we're taking with Pannoni, we're working in the uh, agricultural community for indoor agriculture, basically growing in an indoor environment. And people would say, well, how is that sustainable? Well, when you take a farm to table concept and you move it into downtown Denver or you move it into downtown New York City, where you're growing vegetables and the transportation of that product is 50 feet to the grocery store that's you know right down the road. Now we start to look at the impacts of sustainability when it takes into account all of those other things. Like Roger was saying at the airport, the cars that are sitting at the airport are sitting there idling, waiting for a, 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 a passenger to come. The airport, the airplanes that are flying in, you can't control the emissions that are coming uh, uh, out of an airplane. So when you look at things holistically and what the implications can be around sustainability, um, there's a lot that we can do in in thinking outside the box. You know, most people would say, well, that, you know, uh, urban farming doesn't really make sense because you can't do enough to produce it. But if you take a, an empty warehouse space or a vacant lot and uh, you do a four or five tier grow facility within that within that that space, you could feed an entire neighborhood with multiple products that are grown in an indoor ag environment. And it's an energy intensive environment. That's one of the things we've been applying combined heat and power to, and it will use a, 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 uh, a carbon fuel to provide uh, heating, dehumidification, cooling, and electricity to the grow lights that are in that facility. But when you look at the offset of trucking vegetables from you know, uh, Iowa to you know, wherever they're going to, all of a sudden, it's less of an impact because you're doing it in an urban environment. So this holistic thinking, I think, is really is is really key to to what we want to uh, achieve from a sustainability perspective. And we're, Chuck, we're, should, um, if I could just draw it, so it it is to your point. It's going to take everybody. And I think coming back to the original uh, viewer's question of um, an example with Amazon's uh, charging. Um, all of their electric fleet. fleet. We're not, um, we as consumers are not um, without responsibility as well. So a very simple, simple example is you can, you can help reduce um, Amazon's reliance on that, that truck fleet simply by choosing your Amazon Prime delivery day. So if you're a Prime member, and I, I swear I don't work for Amazon, I just use Amazon Prime, but you know, <laughs> if, you know, do you need that item two days from now or can you just pick, you know, does that truck need to go to your, um, your um, house every other day to, to drop off something that you forgot you needed to add, a, add to your cart or can you pick your uh, Prime delivery day? And so that's one of the things that Amazon has set up to help users help them reduce their reliance on that truck traffic. So it's it's these these small steps that we can all take responsibility for to help kind of drive that that reduction as a part of that bigger picture of becoming more sustainable. And um, I, I agree completely. You know, this is this is not something that one 
uh, company or one individual or one brilliant mind is going to resolve. Um, it's a global uh, implication that requires everybody to, to, to put their oar in the water and row in the same direction. Um, you know, it's going to be uh, an exciting initiative and I think it's going to create significant opportunities going forward. I want to be the one, uh, Roger, I want, I want to be the one who designs that, 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 that skid where I pull my car up in front of the airport <laughs> and I just get out and something takes my bags and something takes my car and I just go and get on the airplane. That's the, that's, I'm waiting for that. That's going to be like the most awesome thing that was ever invented. Well, we're trying to design actually at Dallas as part of the vision, the new parking structure where that would happen. You pull up to the curb, you're right there. Uh, by the way, Japan does have the, their tugs they're using. They do have a sled too, but they, they have autonomous tugs that go park your car for you. All right. I'm going to get off the plane, type into my phone, get my car, walk to the gate. My car is there. My baggage is there. And it was all environmentally friendly in the process. That's like a, that's a dream. That, that'll be there sooner than I think, uh, <laughs> than, than we can imagine. It's crazy to think that. Well, uh, well, you know, uh, everybody on the panel, uh, Chris, Bob, Roger, Lindsay, um, it was good conversation. I think this is the type of conversation that, that, that needs to be had on a more regular basis. We had a good number of attendees. We got to a couple of questions that they had, but the, the topic of conversation was 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 broad. Um, I'd been asked to uh, to move to close up around uh, 20 after. Um, Mike Sawyer, if you want to jump on here, uh, is uh, what's the uh, the agenda for closing out this program? He's on mute. Um, Actually, Scott York here. We were going to turn the time over to uh, Jack Vega to close it out. Excellent. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank the panelists for your support and your insightful responses to the questions. Uh, I always enjoy participating in a panel where I, I go away uh, a little bit smarter than when I came in, and uh, you guys have helped me do that. Uh, Roger, I really applaud you for the efforts that uh, are being undertaken at, uh, at, at, with, at, within EMWA. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future to make this a more sustainable future. We'll turn it back over to Jack now to uh, wrap things up. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. And in addition to uh, thanking uh, uh, Lindsay and Chris, I want to recognize the airport's authority uh, Roger, especially Jack and Bob for their attendance and participation. Um, their leadership of the authority uh, while advancing this significant initiative and continuing to work in a multitude of ways to minimize the impacts on the environment while serving millions of travelers is appreciated. Uh, Jack Potter and his team continue to lead on environmental initiatives uh, as they continue to tackle the challenges presented during uh, exceptionally difficult pandemic effects on system operations. Um, so that is very much appreciated and we thank them for their commitment and their leadership. Um, I also wanted to remind our members and our attendees that on March 25th at noon, we're having a lunchtime program with United Airlines. Uh, our speakers will be Lauren Riley, the Managing Director for Global Environmental Affairs and Sustainability, uh, Eddie Gordon, Managing Director of the Dulles Hub, and Evan Koppel, the Director of Sales for the Mid-Atlantic Region. Um, so again, uh, to our panelists, thank you. Um, and uh, have a great um, afternoon. And uh, we appreciate your interest and in sustainability in the airport. Have a great thanks. afternoon. Thanks, Jack. Everybody, uh, thanks to the audience for uh, sticking with us here. We had a great turnout. We've got questions that uh, we're going to get uh, to uh, the presentation will be available to everybody who, who participated and we're going to get uh, any uh, straggler questions directed to uh, specific panelists uh, that could uh, be answered and, and sent out with the uh, with the presentations as well. Thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great afternoon and uh, look forward to the next one.